Here's something weird. 58% of farmers in the UK supported to leave the EU. And that is although 35-50% to of their gross income comes directly from the EU through the EU agricultural subsidies. Populism is on the rise everywhere in Western democracies. Yet it is hard to explain why people even vote against their interests. So let me give you a detailed picture. Here are the two leading explanations from political science for why populism is on the rise. The two predominant explanations that we have is the economic insecurity explanation and the cultural backlash explanation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain both of these, then I'm going to tell you which of these is more relevant, and in the end we're going to talk about what we can do to stop populism. The idea is very simple. People vote for populist parties because they're in a bad economic situation. And over the past decades, there have been four large trends which have harmed a particular segment of the society, mainly low-skilled workers. The first of these trends is trade liberalization. China has entered the World Trade Organization in 2001, and we've studied extensively what happened to the US economy as a consequence of that. And what happened was that China imported more and more goods in the US, and the particular sectors where China now imported products they lost massively in the US. Unemployment rose, especially in the manufacturing sector, as a result of the China imports. And we've also been able to say that this economic harm that came through opening trade with China led people to vote for Trump in the 2016 election. The estimate is that about 5% of Trump votes can actually be attributed to trade liberalization and the trade relationship between the US and China. Another term we have is technological advances. Robots once again hurt manufacturing workers who are at the low skill end of the spectrum. Managers do not need to struggle with robots for their jobs, but manufacturing workers do. And what we've actually seen is we have an increase, we've seen an increase in the gap between those who are educated and those who are not. The returns to education have been growing and growing and growing, leaving one segment of the population to profit very highly, those who are highly educated, but another segment of the population to actually lose due to this trend. Another big event was the financial crisis in 2008. And many saw in this financial crisis once again a failure of the system to protect the ordinary man. Remember that the ordinary people, the taxpayers, were actually bailing out the banks or bailing out the elites, which once again paints a picture. We have a losing segment of the society, the low skilled work. And of course, the last big trend is immigration. We've seen a lot of immigration to Western countries, especially of low skilled workers. And who are these low-skilled immigrants competing with on a labor market? Of course, it's also the low-skilled natives. So you see that these four big trends harmed one particular group in the society. And the explanation of the economic insecurity hypothesis is, you see, we have these large trends that harm one segment of the society, and, and this segment responds simply by voting anti-system, anti-establishment, in other words, by voting for populist parties. The cultural backlash explanation says that there is a culture war in our society. On one hand, we have these very progressive people, and on the other hand, we have people who hold traditional views. And they feel threatened by these cultural progressive thinkers, and the way they respond is they respond by voting populists, by voting the people who promise to keep the traditional system in place. And there is ample support for this explanation being a driver in populist voting decisions. I want to quickly talk about one study. It's by Marco Tabellini, and he looks at immigration in the US between 1910 and 1930, which was induced by World War I. And what he finds is that these migration movements, they actually increased the natives' employment and they spurred industrial production. But nonetheless, at the time, there were very strong anti-immigration policies in some areas of the US. And he asked the question, why is that the case? Can we trace down who's actually against immigration, although it is economically a good idea? And what he shows is that people are more opposed to immigration in those regions where the immigrants are from a different culture. In other words, where the immigrants maybe have a different religion. So this is a very clear example that people were not against immigration for economic reasons. They were against immigration because it threatened the culture that they were used to. So with every social phenomenon, the rise of populism cannot be explained by one of these theories alone. And they also reinforce each other. 
If you think about someone might lose his job and only then start to worry about immigration because he feels economically insecure and now he also feels threatened by his identity because he's unemployed in the system. So in the next section I'm going to give you some evidence onto how important each of these factors are in explaining the rise of populism. So here's what I did. I used survey data from the European Social Survey in 2023 for Germany, Austria and Switzerland, so all German-speaking countries in Europe. They ask about 5,000 people, a long list of questions, and I select questions on cultural identity and economic insecurity. My factors for measuring economic insecurity of an individual are total income of the household, how economically insecure the person feels on a scale to 1 to 10, whether that person has been unemployed in the last three months, and if the main source of income of that household is from social benefits. The questions I use to determine how important traditional cultural values are for a person are how the individual thinks that cultural life is influenced by immigrants, whether immigrants make the country better or worse, if they think that men and women should work equally in a family, how often they pray, which I think is a great way to measure if a person is an active practitioner of one of the large traditional religions. Also, how important they feel about traditions and if they think women should be protected by men and their stance on homosexuality. And now what I do is I use a machine learning algorithm to predict whether a person that responds in a certain way to these questions votes populist or non-populist. And if you're interested, you can look into my paper on this. But here's the result. Here's the importance of these variables for predicting if a person votes populist or not. What you can see is if you add up the importance of the economic insecurity variables, they are about 25%. And the traditional cultural values variables, they make up about 75% of the predictive power of the model. So what does this tell us? This tells us that both hypotheses are important in explaining whether a person votes populist or not. But it also tells us that the cultural backlash hypothesis is a bigger driver in populist voting decisions than economic insecurity. And this is in line with previous research papers that have looked at this question. So where does this leave us? First, I think it's important to ensure that no one's left behind economically not only to get rid of populism, but because I think it's a moral duty. With such affluent societies, we should make sure that no one's really separate. But this will not get rid of populism. After all, countries like Denmark and Sweden with very great wealth estates still have an issue with populism. The real issue we need to address is the culture war that we have in our society. And how to do that, I don't have a good answer. There are some people that argue that this problem will get rid of itself because the people who hold the traditional values, well, they're predominantly old and they will die away. But I don't think that's very convincing. I mean, if you look at Andrew Tate, people like that, they are very popular, even among younger generations. My first thoughts are that we need to stop creating hate content. We do that a lot. We talk in this us against them, winners and losers mindset, but that's not a clever mindset. And also, it's also not the only mindset. Instead of talking about winners and losers, we should start about talking winners and winners. We can create a society in which everybody has a good life. And the second, perhaps more important thought is that we've started to criticize traditional ways of living, but we haven't created alternative ways of living yet. We do not have created good alternative visions. There are a lot of Hollywood movies which end with a family reunion, but I don't have a particularly progressive different ending. And maybe there does not have to be a different ending, but my point is we have not figured out the progressive story. We have understood the issues with many of our traditional ways of living, but now we need to talk about what our alternative ways of living should be. Thank you so much for watching this video. I think it's a very important topic and I've just started researching on this this week. So nothing of this is set in stone. I'm not very sure about a lot of the things. I will link my working paper, the current version, below. If you have any comments on that, I'm very happy if you reach out to me. So thank you so much.